Hi, good afternoon, and um, welcome to our event um, on China's and Russia's shock power, how big a threat. Um, this event is co-sponsored by the Harriman Institute and the Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Um, and we're very, very fortunate to welcome uh, Mr. Chris Walker. First, let me note, though, that this event is on the record. And, um, and so please be aware of that when you make statements. Um, and so um, my role here today is to introduce Mr. Walker. Um, you might be wondering, um, I didn't say my name. I'm Takako Ikutani. I'm a associate professor of political science here at Columbia, I teach Japanese politics, and we have Chris Walker as our speaker from um, National Endowment for Democracy, as well as Professor Andrew Nathan here, um, and Professor Alexander Cooley, Columbia's proud China and Russia experts. Um, the only reason why I'm introducing today is that we met at a conference in Senegal, and I heard that you're a SIPA grad, and I said, well, then you have to come to SIPA to speak. And so my role here is just to introduce and then sit back. But um, let me reemphasize that Mr. Walker is a proud SIPA graduate and, and that he has been the um, person who coined the term, I can say, sharp power, which has been a major topic of discussion in think tanks and in universities in the United States um, this year. Um, he is Vice President for Studies and Analysis at the National Endowment for Democracy, Democracy. and in, his, in this capacity, he oversees the department responsible for NED's multifaceted and analytical work. Previously, Mr. Walker was Vice President for Strategy Analysis at Freedom House, and he has also served as Adjunct Assistant Professor of International Affairs at New York University's Center for Global Affairs. He holds a BA from Binghamton University and MA from Columbia's University School of International Public Affairs. Mr. Walker has been at the forefront of discussion on authoritarian influence on democratic systems, including um, through what he has termed sharp power. His articles has appeared in a number of publications, including the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, and Foreign Affairs. He's co-editor with Larry Diamond and Mark Plattner of the edited volume Authoritarian Authoritarianism Goes Global, The Challenge to Democracy, and co-editor of the report Sharp Power, Rising Authoritarian Influence, which many of you must be familiar with. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the mic to Mr. Walker and then proceed with, um, you go first, um, Professor Nathan mm -hmm. and Professor Cooley. Thank you so much. So I'd like to start by uh, thanking the organizers, um, Takako Hikitani um, and Alex Cooley and their respective institutions. It's really a pleasure to be back here at the Harriman Institute at Columbia. And it's really a pleasure for me to be speaking with um, Andrew Nathan and Alex Cooley, both of whom were contributors to the initiative we undertook that uh, Professor Hikatani alluded to, Authoritarianism Goes Global. This was a, an extensive initiative we undertook that resulted in the publication of a book to which uh, both um, Alex and Andy contributed to. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to see these, I would commend it to everyone. They're really first-rate articles, one on the emergence of authoritarian counter-norms, and the other um, looking through what the implications of China's growing uh, global reach implied for uh, democratic institutions and values. And these are quite relevant to the discussion today. And so I'll, I'll take a few minutes just to give what I think are the um, changes that have occurred in the recent past that deserve more scrutiny as it relates to the exertion of influence by um, powerful, well-resourced authoritarian states and how um, democracies are responding to this in an environment that's, I think, quite uncertain and turbulent more generally. So I think what I would stress at the outset is that countries like China and Russia are exerting uh, more influence today than I think at any time in the recent past. Um, this is a function both of the era of hyper-globalization we're in, and I think also the resources and ambition that certainly the governments in China and Russia have today. It's not only those countries. I think we see versions of this um, in other authoritarian states, a country like Azerbaijan, which is far smaller than Russia and China, of course, but nevertheless has exerted, uh, in my view, adverse influence, for example, in bodies like the Council of Europe and the um, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And I can talk a little bit about that later. But for the purposes of this discussion, I think China and Russia are most relevant. And in many respects, if we look, say, at the last decade or so, 
much of the influence that these countries have been exerted has not been in the form of military um, influence uh, or economic coercion, frequently understood as hard power. Um, of course, Russia in the recent past has exerted its fair share of hard power in places like Georgia, Ukraine, and Syria. Uh, but fighter jets and tanks have not really been the uh, principal edge of Russia's global influence. We can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, China, too, is flexing its military muscles in the South China Sea. But I think it's fair to say that, by and large, the influence that China's been exerting uh, hasn't principally been in the military or kinetic sphere. And meanwhile, the term soft power has become a political science catch-all for uh, influence that isn't seen as hard, as a practical matter. Um, if you look at uh, major publications or mainstream media, invariably the term soft power will be used in this way. It's not hard to find examples of this. Um, but I would argue that in, the, in this recent period, there are forms of influence that are not evidently soft in the way it's been commonly understood since the term uh, came into con uh, common usage at the end of the Cold War. And at the same time, it's not necessarily hard in the sense of the application of military force. And according to Joseph Nye's original definition of the term soft power, um, it's based on attraction. It's based on the um, ability to persuade. It's based on the uh, ability of independent civil society from a given country to uh, engender attractiveness when it's used. Um, and hard power is a function of military or economic uh, might in this context. And I think as the Cold War era faded, analysts, journalists, and others who've been covering these kinds of issues, especially in the democracies, um, looked at all the influence being exerted through the customary uh, soft power lens. And perhaps that was understandable coming out of the 1990s when there was a certain expectation about how global politics would evolve and emerge. But I would note in um, certainly the last decade and a half, the investments that have been made by countries like Russia, China, and others have been quite extraordinary. So if we look at, um, say, the last decade, in China's case, there have been literally tens of billions of dollars spent on outward-facing uh, influence efforts of various stripes. Some of them more visible and evident, um, the state media um, enterprises that have gotten some notoriety get quite a bit of attention, but this is only one small part of the overall investment. It includes things like people-to-people -people exchanges, wide-ranging cultural activities, the media enterprises, and a host of other forms of engagement. Uh, the most notable of these that gets the most attention, but I think it's a little bit disproportionate, are the Confucius Institutes, which are run by uh, Hanban, which is the Chinese state's propaganda um, agency. And these uh, institutions are embedded within uh, the educational institutions within open societies and talk a little bit about how they operate and what the uh, costs and benefits of having them are. Uh, but these were only one small part of the Chinese party state's engagement in the educational sector, just to use this one sector as an example. And if we look at the last 15 years, um, in the Russian case, uh, they've invested an enormous amount, the Russian authorities have, in their own forms of outreach. Some of this very visible like Russia's RT uh, media enterprise, it includes Sputnik, which is another visible uh, enterprise in this regard. But it's certainly not limited to that. There's a wide range of other instruments that the Russian state and its surrogates have been um, investing in. And I would note that these efforts really uh, gained momentum in the middle part of the first decade of this century. So it was around 2005, 2006, when these investments really took off. It's actually when uh, RT was um, founded around, around that time. And it's around the time that um, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook also were founded. Google was a little bit before that. And I think the fact that um, social media and the digital engines really started moving in earnest is not disconnected from this whole discussion about um, how um, certain forms of influence are projected globally today. And we might come back to that a little bit later. And so I would say that although 
um, the Russian authorities, the Chinese authorities, uh, undertake some activities that credibly fall into the normal sphere of public diplomacy or what's been alluded to as soft power, uh, the nature of these countries' political system invariably colors their efforts. And this factor has been largely uh, underestimated over the years. So in the case of China, to use this example, uh, educational and cultural initiatives that are supported by the Chinese state or its surrogates um, will often have an authoritarian determination to monopolize ideas, suppress alternative narratives, and exploit partner institutions. Some of this is undertaken by the United Front Work Department, um, which has gotten more attention in the recent past, but is still, I think, in, in many respects, poorly understood by audiences who should have a better understanding of these issues. China's dramatically expanded its economic interest, interests and business footprint around the globe, and its government has focused on initiatives that often masks its policies and its effort to uh, suppress to the extent possible voices beyond China's borders that are critical of the Chinese Communist Party. And if you want to see some very good work on these kinds of issues, I would commend people here to the recently released, it was November of uh, 2018, a report released by the Asia Society and the Hoover Institution, a project led by Larry Diamond and Orville Schell, um, which looked principally at these issues in the United States context, but also looked at a number of other democracies in Europe, Australia and elsewhere, where um, the influence and engagement by the Chinese authorities and their surrogates was scrutinized, um, I think in a very fair way, both uh, how it could be beneficial, but also it could be uh, problematic for the integrity of democratic systems. They covered in this context um, Australia um, in some respects. This is a country which has really um, engaged on the issue of China's influence. And for those of you who haven't looked at this, uh, the writings of people like uh, John Fitzgerald at Swinburne University, John Garneau, who's a journalist, um, an analyst, and others, uh, is well worth looking at uh, to get a sense of how uh, Australia's democracy has come to grips with uh, the multifaceted forms of engagement that China has undertaken there. Russia, for its part, um, I think largely determined years ago that um, it didn't need to convince the world that their autocratic system was appealing in its own right, and instead what the Russian government and its surrogates have done uh, over the years uh, is that they realized that they could achieve their objectives by democracy appealing relatively less attractive. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in more on this, I would commend people, for example, to the two Kremlin playbook reports that were issued by uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Center for uh, the Study of Democracy based in Sofia, Bulgaria. Really first-rate work looking at these kinds of issues in a variety of countries. Um, it's fair to say in this context that uh, the sort of efforts that Russia has undertaken doesn't happen in a vacuum. They've leveraged the evident challenges that the democracies have undergone in the last decade. And as we've seen in uh, North America, much of Europe, uh, the Russian approach has been to uh, find cleavage points and leverage existing problems within the democracies and stoke and amplify them. I think, just to put this in perspective for um, if we were having this discussion, say, in 2000, five or six, certainly predating uh, Russia's cyber attack on Estonia or the military conflict in Georgia or the annexation of Crimea or the attack on uh, Ukraine, which continues to this day, um, or for that matter, the recent um, depositing of troops into Venezuela. I think if we had had this chat in mid-2000s, say, it would be unthinkable that Russia would be able to intrude into uh, the elections of the U.S. or Canada or many uh, open societies of Europe. It would have seemed pretty much unthinkable. I'm not aware of anyone who 10 or 12 years ago would have said something like that. Maybe <coughs> people in this room know people who are thinking that way, but I would be surprised. And yet they managed to do it. And part of this is a function of globalization. Part of, part of it is a function of uh, purposing resources to these ends by uh, states that have unchecked power, in my view. And so what I would stress in this context is that there are a set of animating principles, we can call, uh, that authoritarian states have where there aren't independent institutions to check state power, 
so in China today, but it's true in Russia in large measure, uh, civil society is under enormous stress and operates in the breach rather than the main. Independent media, likewise, uh, is far weaker in both of those countries today than it was a decade ago. In China, it's surely the case that it's weaker today than at the outset of Xi Jinping's coming to power. Um, political parties, of course, don't have much space in these areas. That contributes to an environment of unchecked power that can be exerted in unchecked ways. In an era of globalization, this can be projected beyond borders with greater ease. And so the animating principles, I would argue, of the authoritarian systems are state power is paramount. Relatedly, non-governmental independent actors are systematically marginalized or sidelined altogether. There are always limits on political expression and increasingly beyond the borders of the PRC or the Russian Federation, efforts to mute critics of the authorities in those countries. And as a practical matter, the devaluing or degrading of the rule of law. And so in China's case, we have what um, is sometimes referred to as rule by law. There's certainly a version of this in Russia. Uh, and these features or characteristics or animating principles in an era of globalization can be applied in open societies in ways that simply weren't uh, possible looking back 10 or 20 years ago. It's not to say they can be applied wholesale or without restrictions. That's not the case. They're applied, in my view, to the extent to which there are um, there is space and uh, the incapacity, say, of civil society or other institutions um, that can um, respond to these sorts of challenges. So, for example, and I won't go into great detail now, but I'm happy to answer questions, uh, China's engagement in sub-Saharan Africa is quite considerable in a range of spheres, and many of the open societies, young democracies there, uh, are profoundly ill-equipped to deal with this, in my view. So, for example, um, just having basic knowledge in the policy community or in the civil society ranks of uh, China's foreign policy or its um, the way in which the government operates in China is extremely weak, and it puts these countries at a disadvantage at a minimum to have those societies have an informed view of how China operates within their borders. And it's not so surprising that in many of these cases, the um, features of the Belt and Road Initiative will often include um, closed bidding or procurement practices that include Chinese investments that are not um, typically so transparent. Uh, and it's very difficult for these societies to respond, I think, in a, in a meaningful way in many of these cases. So just as I, as I conclude these observations, I think critical to the development of the forms of influence that have come into view in the recent past has been uh, the exploitation of an asymmetry, which is in this era of hyper-globalization, and I know Alex has written about this in various, various ways and forms, uh, the regimes in both China and Russia have raised the barriers to external political and cultural influence in their own countries while they've exploited the openness of uh, open societies beyond their borders. And this led us, um, in the context of work we did, and I'm happy to talk more about the initiative, but uh, we released our what the, the report we titled um, Sharp Power Rising Authoritarian Interest in December 2017. That project, based on the work of um, think tanks that uh, partnered with us working in four young democracies led us to uh, the conclusion that the use of the term soft power in areas of this influence simply didn't fit well and we came to the conclusion that a definition that was more suitable for much of what we were seeing was this notion of sharp power which we defined as an approach to international affairs that involves efforts at censorship or the use of manipulation to degrade the integrity of independent institutions. And so finally, I would say that the, the skeptic's dismissiveness of authoritarian influence over, say, the last 15 to 20 years led to a certain complacency, which revealed itself in many ways in the unpreparedness in the election intrusions that we've experienced and others have, um, allowing authoritarians through trial and error to refine existing methods and develop much more powerful array of influence activities. I would note many of these activities have been tested within the confines of the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China. So it's not as though these were pulled out of thin air, but much of the digital harassment, much of the um, sidelining of independent voices 
has been developed within these countries and now it's being used with various, way, various forms of applications beyond their borders. And so finally, I would say that the democracy's complacency concer concerning the evolution of um, sharp power has been informed by their reliance in many respects on the, sh on the soft power paradigm and that the conceptual vocabulary that we've tended to use since the end of the Cold War hasn't been um, quite uh, appropriate for the new challenges. So I'm going to stop here, but I'm glad to discuss um, what we might do in response or any other questions during the Q&A. You want me to go? So, uh, well, Chris has been a real thought leader on this thing. I actually have known him since his time at Freedom House. And, uh, and after that, he went to the NED. And he runs a kind of internal think tank in the NED that's incredibly productive. And he r really, with his group, but him and the leadership, came up with this idea of sharp power <coughs> published the report that he's alluded to that you can download from the NED website. The Journal of Democracy that he co-edits also uh, keeps its eye on and publishes many interesting articles on this I should just issue. say that Mark Platner and Larry Diamond co-edited it. also I, play a role. Yeah. Uh, they're not here. So <laughs> <laughs> Alex has an in, incredibly good article in the JOD about uh, money power in the world. Uh, and, um, and this project that Chris is leading uh, is ongoing. And w after the report came out from NED, it, 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 it sort of overwhelmed the media. The yeah. Economist had a cover story on it. And as Takako said, you know, the uh, um, foreign Affairs ran an article that Chris wrote and so on. So it's been a very, very influential concept. And it's fit in with a rising concern. There are quite a few other reports that have come out around the same time that are trying to get a grip on this issue as far as the China piece of it is concerned. So uh, Chris mentioned the Hoover report. Do you remember the name of it? American interest, Const Chinese influence. And then something like mm -hmm. vig constructive, constructive vigilance. vigilance. So yeah. you can download that as well. And what yeah. Chris didn't mention, I think, is that he participated in that study group. And it consists of an attempt to study Chinese influence attempts throughout the American system in academia, media, state and local government, and different sectors with appendices about other countries like Australia and New Zealand and Europe and so on and so forth. So that's a, an area where people are trying to get a grip on this. In addition, uh, Orville Schell, who with Larry Diamond co-edited the Hoover Report, he co-edited with Susan Shirk of UCSD a report yeah. published by the Asia Society, <clears throat> which focuses a little differently. The Hoover Report focuses on Chinese influence in the United States. Also, I might mention over Chinese language media in the United States. The Asia Society report is looking at the changing U.S.-China relationship as a matter of American foreign policy. So these two things are certainly related. And that one calls for, has a, also has a slogan, something like what we and you participated in that group. I didn't, I didn't participate in that one. But. A little bit. No? OK. <laughs> uh, and uh, to sort of re, you know, rejigger American-China policy in light of many emerging issues. The Berlin-based Merricks China Center, Mercator Institute, they have published a report on Chinese influence activities in Europe. The European Council on Foreign Relations Francois Godemont published a report as well on that problem. Uh, Chris mentioned uh, Australia, and he mentioned John Garneau and John Fitzgerald. There's a book by a guy named Clive Hamilton. It's a rather controversial book, but in my assessment, basically pretty accurate, called Silent Invasion. So that's a scary title. And the book has a lot of scary stuff in it about Chinese influence in Australia. And then a friend of ours from New Zealand, Anne-Marie Brady, published a paper, a very strong paper you can download from the web called Magic Weapons about Chinese influence in New Zealand. So th there is a widespread concern uh, over... Uh, you know, of course, there's the concern over Chinese human rights issues and 
authoritarianism at home, but these things I'm talking about represent a concern in the the democratic countries, especially the sort of advanced and the you know West, as opposed to the developing world, which Chris is paying more attention to. Africa and and Latin America and so forth. A concern in the in the democratic West about the extension of ch sort of intervention of China into our domestic freedoms. You know, so it's one thing if you have authoritarianism at home. It's another thing we think if you're destabilizing uh, our own freedoms or restricting our own freedoms in our own political systems, but I wanted in that connection to talk about three or four maybe sort of issues around around this problem that we are all struggling with. So one of them is to try to understand Chinese goals, which may be, may be similar or different from Russian goals. I mean, Chris suggested there are some differences between them. So from a Chinese point of view, what they're doing is very normal. Uh, first of all, it's no different from what the Americans and the French and the Germans, et cetera, have done, which is to, you know, have uh, Voice of America and Radio Free Asia, Deutsche Welle, and so on, and to broadcast to China and to uh, set up, uh, you know, a, a British Library in China and so on, and to America centers and to try to, uh, uh, what we have come to call soft power to sort of tell. So China has a thing, tell Zhang Hao Jungo de Gusher, tell the China story well. And they, they're like, well, you guys have told the America story for as best as you could for many, many years, and nobody complained about it. Why can't we tell our story? And then as they tell their story, they would be using methods that are nor normal and comfortable to them, like rewarding friends and and not rewarding enemies, let's say, with visas or with other kinds of favors or with setting up your own center like a Confucius Institute. We're giving money. Columbia has a Confucius Institute. We're giving some money there and we're letting you guys run your own institute. We just don't want you to talk about certain things that violate our law. So what's wrong with that? You know, so a certain amount of thought control or censorship um, or mobilization of friendly, the distinction between friends and enemies kind of a thing would be for the Chinese. Really, it would be puzzling to say, what, why are the foreigners uncomfortable about this? Um, from our point of view, the puzzle is, what are the Chinese goals? So if we were to understand it as simply, say, facilitating the learning of Chinese language in, in other countries, which we would welcome, and especially, I mean, Colombia has a very wonderful Chinese language program that the university pays for itself, but if you're a smaller or less well-financed university and you don't have Chinese and you want to have it for your students and China will pay for it, the Chinese would say that's a win-win situation. Uh, but. Um, but if, uh, so where does it cross the line? And Chris raised this question. The Australian Prime Minister, which one? Malcolm Turnbull. Turnbull, with his advice from probably our friend John Garneau, came up with a 3C slogan. If, if the influence is corrupt, covert, corrupt, or coercive, then it's bad, which sounds correct, I guess, but um, it's often a little bit hard to apply those standards to a particular instance. So if a Chinese private company, which is connected as are all Chinese private companies loyal to the Communist Party and connected in some way to the United Front Work Department, purchases a Chinese language newspaper in the United States or radio station, or if the Chinese government gives visas to certain people and not to other people or, you know, many, many things that happen. Or if the Chinese government comes to a think tank in the United States and says, we'd like to have a project and it's going to be on um, mutual interest in, in uh, economic relations and it's not going to be a conference on Tiananmen and Tibet and Xinjiang. 
is that corrupt? Is that coercive? You know, does it fit the three C criterion? Mm -hmm. So there are many, many fine-grained issues. Uh, and part of in assessing the danger of these things is to sort of try to look at the intent. If it's just, uh, is, is there an intent, for example, to promote the China model and to undermine democracy and to replace democracies with authoritarian regimes, which might be more of a, might be an especially uh, sort of uh, focus issue for Chinese behavior in Africa, for example. So we have to assess this. My own assessment is that they're not really trying to overthrow democracies, but one may still say, does their presence nonetheless have that effect of undermining democracy? So I, I'm not going to give an answer to this now because that would I don't have an answer, but it would take a long time. But I think this is one of the issues that we're looking at. And, um, and then, the, uh, well, I, I've already said two issues. One is China's goal. The other one is the red line between what's acceptable and not. So especially in this Hoover report, we, we, we struggle very hard to assess that red line. There's also recently been a short memo issued by Human Rights Watch mm -hmm. about academic freedom, mm -hmm. how to the principles for protecting academic freedom, which doesn't apply only to China. It applies as well, for example, to Saudi donations or uh, Azerbaijani donations and so forth, or, or to, donate, to many, many funds that might be offered to an academic institution from the Ukrainian community in the New York, for example, something like that. We always have these academic freedom issues. And so you could look at the Human Rights Watch report to see um, uh, <clears throat> what they say, but what what the, the basic principle there is something like transparency and faculty governance. So, for example, as I said, Columbia has a Confucius Institute, and so far as I know, its its activities are unexceptional. I I have no complaint about them that I know about, but part of the, that may be partly because I don't know anything <laughs> about what they're doing. They don't uh, really. Uh, publicize it, and uh, I hear about this and that, and it sounds fine. Uh, but uh, the, the contract that the Chinese Hanban, the, the supervising organization inside the Chinese Ministry of Education, signs with American universities contains a secrecy clause that this contract will be mm -hmm. secret. And I think that that's adverse to academic freedom, and I have advocated that Columbia violate that contract provision and make the contract public like Trump's tax returns. Um, there's probably nothing else. And then there's a feature in those contracts, as we know, somehow we know it, although the contracts are secret, that says the Confucius Institute can't do anything that violates Chinese law, which sounds kind of reasonable in a in a sense, why would they pay for something to violate their law, except that Chinese law is extremely capacious and vague, and uh, that sh probably means that you cannot discuss Tibet and Tiananmen, even though I'm not aware of any actual statute law in China that bans that. So I think transparency and faculty governance, which are connected, I mean, transparency to the faculty, let the faculty no, there are procedures in the university for faculty governance, for example, the academic review committee. I mean, students probably don't know, and you're lucky not to know, but there's a committee that investigates every unit mm -hmm. uh, periodically. So that would be uh, uh, a principle. Um, the, the visa issue is kind of interesting because I, I've been denied a visa since 2001, and that wasn't even the first time. I was denied a visa to, in two other cycles for things that I had done. But in 2001, I co-edited the Tiananmen papers, and since that time, I haven't been able to get a visa, which I personally have always regarded as predictable and reasonable because the Tiananmen papers, if you know anything about it, is a you know, very... I think, strong attack on, you know, the legitimacy of the regime, and it's also a state secrets uh, leak. 
<coughs> so for many, many years, I was denied a visa, and many of my friends and people in the U.S. government and people in China were quite sympathetic to me about it, but we never made a big stink. But as this issue has arisen of uh, Chinese arguably corrupt, coer coercive, and what did I say? Covert. Covert attempts to influence and you know restrict discourse and academic and media freedom in the United States. The issue of visa denial has risen to become a kind of issue of principle. It's not an Andy Nathan issue and Perry mm -hmm. Link issue anymore. It's kind of been seen as part of a bigger package and I think appropriately so. I mean my case is unusual and special but there is a bigger issue which is the use by China to incentivize and disincentivize newspaper organizations or, or rather media organizations as well as the academic community. So there should be very normally 10-year multiple entry visas between China and the United States in both directions for academics and people. And journalism visas are issued very easily by the United States and so from a reciprocity point of view the visa situation should be pretty easy, but it's really not reciprocal. Again, not about me, but broadly. And, it, and the Chinese side has been using it. So in the Times two days or three days ago, there was a story about this professor, Zhu Feng, from Nanjing University, I think, who was, who was uh, denied, whose visa was canceled. He came to the United States, and at the airport, they canceled his visa and sent him back. Now, I know this guy, Zhu Feng. He's a good guy, in my opinion. He's a very open-minded scholar. I think, to, of course, we never know who has what connection with whom, but my judgment is he's a very good independent scholar. Uh, but I think what we're seeing, and we'll wait and see how this works, is the U.S. government now raising this issue of visas to the level of, you know, you hit me, I hit you. Whether that's a good idea, whether Ju Feng was the right case, whether that's going to produce any good results, we'll have to wait and see. Um, this gets me to my last uh, thing I wanted to talk about is what are we going to do about this? So should there be? Uh, so we have the academic freedom idea and faculty governance. We have the, you know, playing the tit-for-tat game with visas and stuff. It's, there, there is the proposal that, uh, that uh, groups that lobby for the Chinese, that there be a stricter enforcement of the Foreign Agents Registration Act, the FARA Act, so that groups that have, in effect, lobbied for the Chinese interests without registering will be forced. And, and the bottom line is there are not a lot of good answers out there about how the free societies can yeah. defend themselves against what Chris has identified as sharp power. And part of it is that we are um, appropriately afraid, worried about sacrificing our own principles in the effort to answer these challenges. So, for example, the example I just mentioned of denying a visa to a scholar who's a very valuable exchange partner seems to be uh, hurting our own interests. Denying, say, vis visas to... Of course, if somebody is a known spy and the federal government should be able to know in many, many cases that an individual is a spy under either academic or journalistic cover, then fine. But if you're just hurting re real academics and journalists in order to send a message, are we the losers? And Susan Shirk, who was the co-editor of the Asia Society report that I mentioned before with Orville Schell, has expressed both in our study group and in public her concern that we not get into a racialized red scare where everybody who's ethnically Chinese becomes a subject of suspicion. So we, in answering the sharp power, we have to protect the values that we're, that we're, that are the very reason why we're trying to, that are the things we're trying to protect. And so uh, we haven't really figured out a whole lot of good ways to do that. But to come back to Chris's report, he has done a tremendous service by um, 
bringing attention, being the first and the best and the clearest to bring attention to this whole problem so that we can begin to think about it creatively. Great. So, no, first of all, uh, thank you uh, to Professor uh, Kotani for organizing this. And all, you know, Chris would uh, draw me in and Andy too, no matter where they were speaking, but it's also wonderful to collaborate in terms of the Weatherhead and the Harriman Institute. And, you know, I hope we can do more things in the future. I particularly think this conversation on academic freedom and the role of the regional institutes is, is important. Maybe we could even think of other regional institutes we could involve in that. Um, but, but all really topical issues. And, you know, my own sense is, you know, if we don't set our own standards and red lines, others will do it for us in a less, less favorable way. Mm -hmm. And others will define who we are and, and what we do. So I, I, I think it's, it's something we can't avoid. We do need to mix it up, even though there will be a diversity of opinions at the university and perhaps, uh, um, you know, in administration too. So, um, so all of these, I think, are, 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 are important issues. I want to talk a little bit about what I think is important, the sharp <laughs> power concept, and then how it applies to Russia and some some of the similarities and differences maybe to the Chinese. Is China really a case of Chinese experience, right? So um, completely agree with Andy. The, uh, the sharp power concept is a much needed and long due correction to this idea of soft power. I never particularly liked the soft power concept to begin with, uh, but uh, this idea that uh, you know this isn't about projecting a positive image of the sending country. And, and so often over the last decade, I would hear scholars or analysts say, well, you know, Russia's really unpopular. It's even less popular than the U.S. is. You know, look at the Gallup surveys or the Pew surveys and so forth. Like, how can you say that Russia has influence? And that was a very myopic, actually very nigh kind of model about what constitutes sort of influence. And it can only be sort of a positive image mm -hmm. um, abroad. I would say very similarly to this international relations concept, again, not a big fan of it, of soft balancing, right? If you can't hard balance on the military side, you, you do all the non sort of security, all the non hard stuff, um, including influence operations and image pro uh, projections and, and so forth. What I think the sharp power concept helps us get to is this idea of um, ordering and influence within the international system. And I'll just say, you know, uh, from the Russian perspective, they are nearly obsessed with the dimensions of international order. Um, they have conceived of U.S. hegemony and the U.S. hegemonic system, not only in terms of U.S. power, which they've tried to counter in certain areas, certain times, you know, uh, quite uh, <laughs> uh, more successfully than others, but this idea of rules, norms, standards, institutions, international organizations. And when you think about it from their perspective, it makes sense, right? That this to them is the vulnerable fabric of the liberal, so called liberal international order. This is what actually um, is influenceable at a relatively uh, acceptable cost. Uh, both in terms of money and in terms of sort of reputation. So I won't get into all of these aspects, but I'll just mention, for instance, the question of international organizations and whether international organizations are part of the U.S.-led kind of liberal infrastructure or can they be repurposed for another infrastructure. And I think we're starting to see overwhelming evidence, and Chris was at the forefront here with the global uh, authoritarianism goes global volume, that um, regional, you have... A couple of things going on. One is new regional organizations that embody new norms are now becoming more and more networked. Something like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that embodies sort of the three evils, or um, the CSDO, the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, so you're starting to get much more connectivity between kind of the non-Western and kind of the non-liberal embodying sort of institutions. So the the ecosystem of international order is changing. It's becoming more dense, more competitive. It's embodying a greater number of sort of norms uh, and so forth. 
plus existing international institutions are being repurposed. And again, this is sort of a goal that Russia and China share, but you see some dramatic gains on the Russian side here. UNHCR, where you had in two cycles, two different agendas that caught Western policymakers by surprise. One was the traditional values agenda, and the second one was the focus on the family agenda. And both of these, uh, uh, you know, Russia cultivated allies, most notably Arab Gulf countries, and pushed through, uh, um, you know, uh, statements and agendas in these institutions that we you know we would have thought unthinkable sort of ten years ago, right? And relied on a an array of sort of inputs. So um, the OSCE started as an institution that embodied, you know, the political democracy agenda, you know, the um, security agenda, and this, you know, economic agenda. And this part of this was this kind of, you know, values agenda. Values agenda is pretty much dropped out. Yeah, OSCE still has an election monitoring uh, a unit that's relatively insulated in Warsaw because of some institutional design, but this kind of human uh, uh, you know, the, the values-based part of it uh, has very much sort of been stymied, right? The OSCE is, isn't viewed in that way anymore. It's not used that way uh, anymore. So you're seeing kind of new organizations led by Russia and China and the repurposing of sort of existing organizations. That's going on in the international sphere. But from the Russian perspective, um, the turn to sort of sharp power kinds of instruments also um, are, is about perceptions of vulnerabilities uh, in the in Western countries uh, and Western networks themselves. And, you know, uh, I think from the Russian perspective, uh, well, this is the stuff of influence. All great powers influence. You influence, right? You support NGOs, right? Um, you know, Freedom House that has its board, uh, you know, all of its money comes from sort of U.S. government sources. We have the right to influence, too. After all, that's what great powers do. And so then we get into sort of questions of, you know, what's the equivalency? What are influence activities versus aren't? Um, you know, there's been some research in the Cold War that's found that, you know, the Soviet Union and the U.S. sort of, you know, intervened in like 40% of all elections sort of globally, right, sort of going. Um, but, but to us, it's a shock in part because of what Chris said, the kind of 1990s paradigm was, well, wait a minute, we're the ones who influence. It's our norms that go global, right? We don't, you know, we don't sort of accept sort of the backlash. Um, but I think the key to what Chris is saying is not just about influencing, it's about damaging the institutions themselves, right? This kind of corrosive language about blurring uh, kind of different types of accountability uh, and, and then I think there's, there's a real sort of contribution there. Um, I, I actually think there's kind of two different things when we turn to the domestic sphere that sharp power is doing from the Russian perspective, and I think both are encapsulated by your, your definition, but I think there, there are two different forms of what Dan Next and I are calling kind of competitive transnational mobilization. Two different strategies. They're both sharp, right? But the, they both sort of follow classic kind of patterns, albeit with new technologies, right? The first is what we call a networking strategy or a brokering strategy. That is when you take existing communities that may or may not share your values, but actively broker them through personal contacts, resources, um, uh, you know, common agendas to try and create, uh, 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 you know, a common set of uh, influencers and principles on a transnational level. And this is very much what's happened with some of this traditional values, um, but especially when you think of something like World Congress of the Families, right? So the World Congress of the Families was uh, actually pioneered here uh, by the Christian right in the 1990s and it had a few meetings uh, out in Geneva and in Madrid. But um, especially post-2010, um, it got the backing of um, a lot of oligarchs, both uh, in Russia but also in Georgia, and it started to go global. It started actively holding international conferences in places like Moldova and Tbilisi. There was one planned in Moscow and so forth. And um, I'm going to support people like Vladimir Yakunin, right, one of Putin's sort of close uh, kind of advisors, the former railway uh, uh, czar Magnin. And now you have very slick. Uh, we just had a meeting in uh, northern Italy, 
right, uh, in Verona. And so you have agendas that are kind of pro-family, anti-abortion, virulently anti-LGBT, um, and some of it sticks and some of it doesn't, but this is a very different uh, set of interactions and networks than when it was originally sort of founded in the Midwest in the 1990s, right? And this is kind of the counterpart to what we always considered, you know, uh, transnational mobilization would occur, right? But we thought it was going to be things like, you know, uh, uh, you know, banning landmines and, you know, promoting women's rights and sort of promoting the environment. But you can see these similar types of networking and brokering dynamics going on. Uh, in support of other agendas and other values. So that's going on. There's also a kind of a less successful attempt to sort of, you know, network, uh, uh, you know, separatist movements and so forth. Uh, but the intriguing one to me is this kind of populist international too that, that again is getting some of Moscow's backing. That's very different than what I would call the classic wedging strategies, right? And wedging strategies when an external actor projects itself into a society and it seeks to sort of inflame and, 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 and magnify and intensify uh, local divisions, right? That's, I think that's the sharper of the sharp power, but analytically distinct, right? And so we have in, 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 the, in, the, in the sphere of sort of you know, Russian area studies and you know, Russian politics, a big debate about this election interference. Right, and we say, you know, it was all Russia. Russia's everywhere. You know, it's in the media. It's Deripaska and his lawyers. Uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, Russia's almost treated as this domestic political actor, omnipresent, and sort of doing everything. And of course, that's you know, deeply analytically sort of dissatisfying. On the other hand, the Russian line is very much some of the other line that you see domestically. Well, this is crazy to blame your social problems, your political polarization on Russia. That's crazy, right? If anyone, you know, blame you, Gingrich from 1994, who started this kind of like strategy of, you know, intensely sort of polarizing uh, and partisan sort of politics. We have nothing to do with this. Uh, in, in, in fact, um, it's not that we're splitting the difference. There's a very different dynamic going on, right? There's an actual magnification of what's going on. That in itself is a form of transnational contestation. The big example on this is what happened with the Internet Research Agency, right? And if you read the indictment here, uh, uh, you know, through, you know, the Russian troll farms and, and what we know from a lot of media labs who have looked into this now that, uh, you know, the point was not uh, uh, to sort of, uh, you know, promote Russia in this, or even uh, to promote exclusively sort of the candidacy of Donald Trump. It was to actually polarize uh, and, and cluster deepen divisions between communities, especially on contentious <coughs> social issues. Kate Starbird, who's a communication scholar uh, out in UW, uh, University of Washington, she's got a really good paper in line here, but she started from the premise that they were researching um, online communities and Black Lives Matter and the debates around it. And then when the uh, indictments drop, they say, uh-oh, what's going on here? And then once they get the data, they find that a lot of these clusters that they were looking at, really a substantial part of these have been infiltrated by the IRA trolls, right? Now, of course, there's also a long history of sort of, you know, Russia inserting itself and, 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 and talking about uh, racial tensions and problems. I mean, this is you know, part of uh, sort of the civil rights movement here. Um, but, but it's not just on that. Um, there's some interesting public health uh, papers out there on uh, the whole anti-vax debate, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of trolls sort of playing both sides of that. Uh, then, of course, uh, questions on states' rights, sort of very strong on that. So pretty much this range of social issues um, you've seen sort of amplified on this. And my favorite sort of example is the, the account 10 underscore GOP which pretended for 11 months to be the Tennessee Republican Party. It had 300,000 followers on Twitter, right? Was retweeting uh, and engaging in some of the sharper kind of social exchanges. Uh, this is an IRA account, and it actually took the Tennessee Republican Party sort of, you know, you know, over 10 months to identify and actually shut it down, mm -hmm. right? That this was not an official thing. Mm -hmm. So. So to me, this this is the interesting thing. You know, it's 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 the transnational nature of sort of brokering on the one hand, wedging on the other hand. The question of whether it was consequential, did it elect Trump? It's like, 
that that ship has sailed, right? And that's not even the most interesting thing as far as I'm concerned, um, or even the most practically important thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, so all this to say is uh, I think the sharp power concept opens up right, our, our, our research agendas and a lot of these distinct sort of analytical dynamics uh, that, are, uh, that are going on there. I'll say one, one last thing, Andrew reminded me this on, on visas. Um, you know, this is, this is really critical, right? Because we, we, we find ourselves in this situation now we have this oversaturation of information. We have different spheres of media influence. Um, and so then to target the whole infrastructure of being able to sort of network and hold exchanges and hear different points of view, even if you don't like those points of view, it's incredibly damaging, I would say, to us. And I think one of the casualties of the sanctions debate is that we've just had our consular services decimated in Moscow. Um, and so, yes, those of us who have three-year visas in Russia are, 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 are fortunate in some ways, but it's easier for us to get visas to go to Russia than vice versa. And part of the practical problem we have is like when we have a, you know, we're not, we're not as good at weather and planning and thinking ahead, right? So, <laughs> no, no, no. Come up. so if we, no, we're good. yeah, so, uh, so if we don't plan a, a, a conference 12 to 15 months in advance, say we do five or six months, we can't get a U.S. visa for someone who doesn't have one, mm. right? So then we end up in the situation, we're just talking to the same people we talked to last year. Now, many of them who were good, but we're, we're actually failing in our mission of sort of outreach and debate and, and, and sort of pushing the boundaries on that. So that's, that's a big issue right now in terms of our own academic relations and expert communities. Uh, I'm going to moderate the Q&A. Is that right? Okay, right, right. so perfect. So actually, Chris, would you like to respond to anything Andy and I have said before we throw it out? So I think I'm, I'm really um, delighted that the two of you in so many ways agree with me. I'd welcome people who disagree with... Uh, any of the arguments that are here, I think that would be very useful. Uh, I just say on the on the observation, Andy, you made on, and and I think Alex, you also made it as well, on this idea. Well, um, you know, the Brits and the French and the Spaniards, they all use their information outlets to communicate, and so we should do the same. I would argue there's there's quite a difference between Deutsche Welle and the BBC and the British Council and the Cervantes Institute compared with um, the various Russian instruments that are applied in that discussion, or for that matter in China. And, the, and I think the following is key, and that is the, the governance structures around the admittedly imperfect but open and challengeable institutions like Deutsche Welle um, or the BBC uh, or AFP are quite different from the governance structures around CGTN um, or RT for that matter, or Sputnik. Um, and we can talk about what the distinctions are, but it has everything to do with um, having parliaments that have ultimately some relationship to the uh, broadcast um, entities that are operating out of the European examples I, I gave. Uh, they all have their problems and controversies, but invariably, the people who control the purse strings and have some sort of um, policy authority can weigh in in ways that are frankly unthinkable in the Chinese and Russian context. And so that, in the end, uh, feeds into the, in my view, into the overarching uh, editorial character of the uh, Chinese and Russian examples. I'm happy to give more details on that, including in the African context, which I've looked more at recently. But I just maybe say that at the outset. Great, thanks. So why don't we take a, a, just a, a group of questions here, and as you ask a question, just make sure to identify yourself for our speaker. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Will. I'm a GS undergraduate here. Um, I'm from the Republic of China, so I'm very concerned about the machinations that the Communist Party has been enacting, which I guess are called uh, sharp power. And I have one question, basically, what are our options? But I'd like to focus it on two realms that were not discussed today. Um, first one is, all of these strategies have been tested in the Republic of China. And uh, so basically, what can the Republic of China do? And secondly is uh, the tech sphere, which George Soros has called a technological cold war. Um, so Huawei is developing uh, like communications infrastructure in developing countries. And the uh, concern is that they all have back doors that the Communist Party can access. 
So that's a great concern to all of the free world. So what are our options? Great. Thanks for that. Um, another question yep. in the back? Yep. Uh, my name my is Chris. I'd be very interested to hear um, <clears throat> Mr. Walker expand on the misperceptions surrounding United Front work uh, that you referenced in your talk. And I'm curious uh, if anyone can add anything about what sharp power can tell us about the relation between uh, Russia and China, and anything you can add on how formalized any collaboration on these tactics may be, mm -hmm. and if there are any specific investment projects you would highlight as a good gauge for the current state uh, of the bilateral relationship? Great, thank you. Uh, and yes, please. Yeah, actually, my name is Bea I'm here uh, at Harry Manners, a visiting scholar from Helsinki. And actually, my question was related to what you just said, that sort of how, maybe from the methodological perspective as well, that how do we study the collaboration or the suspected collaboration between China and Russia, and especially in this cyber sphere? I, I suspect that there is some, but how to approach it? Maybe you have some views. Great, thank you. So let's uh, let's start with those, and we'll come back for a second uh, batch. Uh, so on the question relating to uh, Taiwan, and it's conceivable that my uh, co-panelists will also have some thoughts to share. I think you've you've identified uh, something that I alluded to, which is I think there, in some ways, uh, Taiwan is um, just to use a Russia analogy, a bit like the Baltics, in the sense that the small, uh, vibrant democracies closest to the large uh, authoritarian powers can often bear the brunt of these things and do. And so the Baltic states, just to use the analogy, uh, have been experiencing Russia's uh, forms of intrusion in their open societies in a variety of ways uh, for a long, long time. Of course, before 1991, it was through the forced annexation of those countries into the then uh, Soviet Union. And since that time, it's been through a variety of um, uh, activities that are adverse to the, in my view, the integrity of the democratic systems in the Baltic states. For some really good reporting and research on what's happening in the Baltics, and then I'll come back to Taiwan, is um, a project called Ray Baltica, R-E Baltica, which is an independent investigative journalism initiative, which has really done brilliant work in systematically looking at the opaque and really troubling sorts of engagement that uh, the <coughs> Russian state and its surrogates have been applying in all three of the Baltic countries. So uh, there's a real problem, and I'm not going to minimize it in the case of Taiwan. I think there are some opportunities, and the, you know, the Taiwan has been, um, I think, using those as well as can be expected under the circumstances in the recent past, which is to really engage internationally and raise awareness about their challenges, to talk about the intrusions into recent elections in Taiwan. Um, I can tell you that as recently as a few years ago, when we had these kinds of discussions, and the discussion might focus on Russia's intrusions in the elections of democracies ranging from Central Europe to Southeastern Europe to Western Europe to North America, when China would come up to say, oh, you know, China's not interested in that. They don't, they don't do that sort of thing. And uh, it's really an unwise analytical start point because there's nothing in principle to stop China given what it's already been testing within its own borders in terms of marshalling um, both the state bureaucracy and those not in the state bureaucracy as trolls and as others who can guide and manipulate social media discussions. Um, that's even before you get to the more technologically um, directed Source of, uh, sorts of um, capacity that the state has invested in there, which I think uh, we're all starting to feel slowly even beyond the PRC's borders. So if you use WeChat, for example, and you're in Australia, or you're in Canada, or you're in the United States, or you're in just about anywhere, you're often going to be subjected to the state uh, authorities' standards of censorship, even if you're using the technology beyond the PRC's borders. That's also something we have to reckon with in the current kind of globalized tech environment. Um, I think Taiwan is doing a very good job at building international solidarity with its um, democracy. Uh, surely more can be done, but it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, steep battle given the asymmetry and resources that are evident between the PRC and Taiwan. Um, I think raising more public awareness in the established democracies 
about what's happening in Taiwan is terribly important. There's, there's in a way, a generational challenge. There are, for example, in the U.S., many people who have a sense of Taiwan's position in the world um, from, I would say, a certain demographic, but my guess is from a younger demographic in the U.S., but perhaps in other democracies, there isn't quite an understanding of how you know, the fact that Taiwan's a democracy and what its historical role is. And so there's probably space for elevating that discussion, which would also have the benefit of um, engendering a better understanding over time for uh, people in, in the democracies about Taiwan's plight. And maybe I'll build your question on the tech sphere yeah. and Huawei into some of the other questions. I think this too was something where, how else to say it? I think open societies have been asleep at the switch for a long, long time on so many levels. There was an article, I want to say it was in the New York Times in the last couple of days on Huawei pointing out that even if uh, many countries wanted to find alternatives to the um, 5G capable technology that's being provided in so many ways through China, uh, it would be extremely difficult to do so in the short term because not many others are producing it and much of it is already uh, deeply embedded in systems, say in Mexico and other parts of South America. It's very true in, um, in Africa. So for example, in Ethiopia, the major uh, media tech providers there, uh, to the exclusion of all others today, are ZTE, Huawei, and Star Times. And Ethiopia is embarking on its own political reform process. Uh, you have to factor in what the implications of the essential uh, tech chokehold capacity of uh, Chinese state tech firms and others, media firms, for that aspiring democracy in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, these challenges replay themselves to different degrees throughout uh, all sorts of countries in, in different uh, parts of the globe. Um, on Russian and Chinese cooperation, I think I'd start by saying, at least as I understand it, there are very few scholars or experts who really have immersed themselves in this, in both sides, speak needed languages in these cases, mm -hmm. and there's surely a gap there, which I may encourage people in the room to mm -hmm. uh, ameliorate over time if you're uh, of a mind and have the ambition to do so. Um, there isn't, as far as I can see from the people I know, um, a whole lot of public information on these sorts of things. You can see, for example, things that are touted by the Russian and Chinese authorities that are there for all to see. For example, uh, media cooperation between Chinese state media and Russian state media. It's a very public level touted. It's hard to know the depth and the impact of that arrangement. All I can say from a very superficial viewing of this, looking at, say, the English language social media feeds of uh, both Chinese and uh, Russian state media, that there is a tendency to align on certain themes. It might not be a wholesale alignment or a clean alignment, but on certain things that Alex alluded to, you can see the threads that run. This is also surely an area for more, I would say, rigorous and meaningful uh, research by those who um, have an interest in it. I'm not aware of people who are doing this in a meaningful way now. And it speaks to another challenge that I'll just take the opportunity to talk about, and I think this is the right place to mention it, which is more broadly the, what I would call the, um, something like a strategic anal analytical or scholarly gap between, on the one hand, people who know China really, really well, yeah. and people who know, for example, Central Europe really well, or Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America, um, it's very rare to find people who know both very well and can put that together. Similarly, um, while it's quite easy to find people in Central Europe, to use this example, who know Russia quite well, it's actually quite difficult to find people in Central Europe or in the Balkans who know China quite well. That's a massive gap mm -hmm. because China is um, uh, setting aside any sort of judgment on the quality of their engagement in those places. They are massively engaged. And so for any citizen who's living, say, in Serbia, which is a good example of this, um, they should simply have a better understanding for their own opinion forming of the sort of relationship they would like to have with China. Yep. And they don't have it right now, in my view. I think it's simply a gap that's there. This will not be solved quickly or easily, but it's something that I think um, educational institu institutions, donors, and others should be thinking hard about, about what a more meaningful 
um, interdisciplinary and interregional sort of approach to these issues would look like to address the new reality. Because if we stay in this siloed stovepipe, uh, there's simply going to be some gaps that will never be filled to address some issues that are there. And, you know, Russia is also engaged in Africa. Uh, there have been some recent articles that are pretty eye-popping in terms of the degree of engagement in the media space, not just military things, it's a host of things. And there too, I'm not convinced that the local policy community or experts really have a feel in the more um, expansive way of the issues in terms of their engagement with Russia and China alike. And I would just say this on the Russia and China collaboration, the, the, the only other thing that I think is, is evident, and someone like Martin Halla, who's based in Prague, who's a sinologist but knows the region quite well, but also has a good eye for Russia, um, I think there's some things that come into view just by looking at the way in which Russia has, for example, accommodated China's 16 plus 1 initiative, which runs from the Baltics, the new EU member states, all the way down through the Balkans with a, with a host of aspiring EU members, aspiring democracies. And some sort of accommodation, whether it's formal, informal, has been arrived at between the Russian authorities and the Chinese authorities. And uh, that has implications for the region, too, because many of the things we've been discussing, discussing in the media sphere, the tech sphere, the educational sphere, in some respect, the political sphere, uh, is being felt by those countries. And now you have two significant, ambitious uh, authoritarian states engaging there. Let me go back for a second round of questions and bring in Andy, too, for some final uh, thoughts and remarks. Yes, please. Rudolf Hauser, retired. Uh, the point I would make and ask questions about is the fact that are we making ourselves more vulnerable? The, one of the great strengths of our systems has been our willingness to expose our errors and problems. But it seems these days, from what I read and survey results, there's a great focus on the failings of the Western society and in the U.S. without a counterbalance of what was good in terms of the enlightenment and our encouragement, a lack of understanding of history among the young. And this would, I see, think, would make us far more vulnerable to these sort of efforts by China and Russia. Any thoughts on that and what we can do about it? Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm a master student of the Harvard Institute, and I, my question is just like, if we, if we bring the normal expansion of Chinese influence, especially the Chinese economic ties with the democratic world, like or other countries, but then if we frame that as a China threat, would that like we we're kind of like evoke a sense of xenophobia, or is like just even hostility mm -hmm. just towards Chinese who live overseas? Yeah, right. Thank you. And we'll take one more, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you knew about these CCTV. Um, it's available on the cheapest level of TV in New York City, uh, Chinese TV station. All right. Maybe you start with Andy. Do you have any concluding thoughts? I don't or know that uh, station. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's a, on Rudolph's point, I mean, I think there's a, sense in the West of the crisis of democracy, which is not the first time we've had that crisis of democracy. Perhaps we always have it, but uh, in the 70s there was this discourse about the ungovernability of democracy and so on. So there's been a consistent authoritarian temptation in the democracies. It's very strong now, obviously. And I agree with you. It, it, uh, it sort of opens the door to these influence attempts. And on the question of the Sinophobia, I think I addressed that in my remarks. I do think that's a big worry. We cannot give up the pluralism of our you know, society in, in, in trying to protect it. That would be self-damaging. Yeah, yeah. um, I'll just mention something on the, the Russia-China. I think you know, the Russia-China issue is it's, it, it's tricky and there's different levels of analysis. Um, I think there's been a lot of skepticism in the U.S. foreign policy community that this is going to be enduring. I think that skepticism is changing. Um, I think there's always been sort of, you know, assumption that, you know, the security fears would override whatever sort of pragmatic accommodation. I think that's changing, too, that you see a demilitarized border, you see pretty good cooperation. Um, you know, uh, the, at the societal level, the trust is not there, right? It's really difficult still for Chinese citizens to get just visas for routine things in Russia uh, and vice versa. 
Um, but there's an infrastructure that's, that's, that's really pressing the relationship. The exchanges, right? The analytical kinds of fora, uh, the expert kind of fields. It just blows out of the water anything we have sort of with Russia, right? And, and by the way, they talk about us all the time. Right, we have no form to talk about them. I mean, you know, it's or to have a you know, U.S. Russia conversation about China, or you know, China U.S. conversation about Russia. So, so there, there's that too. But at the elite level, it is very strong, right? And so, you know, one just a very quick example. Initially, when the AIB Asian, you know, Infrastructure Investment Bank was sort of announced, um, Russia wasn't going to join it, right? Ministry of Finance says no. We got all this other stuff going on. You know, it's too expensive, it's not a priority for us. Besides, we have this Eurasian Economic Union, not going to do it. And went up to the Kremlin, the Kremlin says, no, we are joining, right? And they opened it, and they did it on the grounds of sort of, you know, showing solidarity and sort of this obsession with Western order. But just a, a final comment on that. Look, there's this Africa strategy that Bolton released last year that talks about the need to counter predatory Chinese and Russian investment um, in Africa. And, you know, that's, that's, that's fine. I think, you know, some of the language is inflammatory, but, but that's fine. But then this is, you know, also an administration that doesn't believe in any of these tools. Doesn't believe in foreign aid, except as a lever of influence. Doesn't believe in the UN, but expresses concern that China is sort of taking over the UN, right? All it does is believe in the buildup of military power. So it doesn't have the instruments, actually, to sort of counter the challenge as it's defined it in sort of these third area sort of governance spaces. And Chris, I'll, I'll give you the last word sure. responding to some of these. So in response to Mr. Hauser, I think, um, you know, it's, we've entered this age of um, anger and grievance on so many levels. Yeah. And I, I would put the, the challenge in a larger context, which is if you turn the clock back to 2005, which was, and I alluded to this briefly um, at the outset, this was the, um, the founding of the leading social media um, platforms on the one hand. A couple of years after that, we had the financial crisis, which really was a body blow to democracies writ large, but it was also a body blow to independent journalism, which was already on the ropes in many respects at that point. And now, as we've seen in the last dozen years, in my view, um, the kind of social media-led um, news and information environment is not optimal for the health of democracy. Um, it's not to say there aren't some wonderful things that haven't come out of this. There certainly are. But I think when it comes to news and information of civic relevance and public affairs, it's a different discussion. And we have to sort that out. Um, it's starting to happen in a very uneven way in the democracies, happening a different way in Europe from as it is in, in uh, the United States. But this will be a multi-year presence to struggle through how we find a balance there. And in the meantime, we have the authoritarian resurgence. So we had a number of things happening in a very short period of time that have been a highly challenging to the global order and to the democracies. And, you know, if anything, the authoritarians have the ability to focus without checks on what they're doing on the tech part of this in a very meaningful way. And it was alluded to in the Taiwan context, which is now the Petri dish for a lot of the experimentation by the CCP on these sorts of issues. Uh, there are countries like Finland that have been quite good in terms of their public education on social media. And in fact, they have an initiative, and I'm not sure this is happening quite anywhere else, um, educating a portion of their citizenry on AI and what AI is and the norms that should surround AI. Um, right now, on that count, we have either the military or the commercial sphere leading the way on AI. That won't be a healthy thing for um, democracies over time, in my view. We need much more meaningful civil society discussion about how we, as citizens, would like AI to be governed and what norms should go around that. And finally, I think, you know, the, um, the question of how we uh, deal with vulnerabil vulnerabilities of the open societies is one that I think we're starting to come to terms with. In a sense, the uh, experience in Australia is a, is a good one to look at. It wasn't perfect, but it was a democratic society's um, effort in pretty short order to go from raising public awareness, identifying problems, having a meaningful public debate and a policy debate with dozens of hearings held at the legislative level, uh, and then legislative proposals and regulatory proposals to address the problems, some of which were amended, some of which were rejected, some of which were adopted. Uh, and they still have a long way to go, but I suspect a version of this will replay itself across a host of countries. 
And then at that point, the hard part begins, which in my view is how institutions like Columbia University and other open academic institutions find their own voluntary codes and standards that are consistent with the contemporary challenges. And that won't happen overnight either, but I'm hoping those discussions will become more meaningful and intensive in the foreseeable future. And Chris, well, I'd like, on behalf of uh, Weatherhead Institute, Herman Institute, I'd like to thank again Professor Hikotani, Professor Nathan. Uh, thank you, Chris, for um, all of your insights and coming here. We hope you'll, you'll visit us again soon as the project progresses. Thank you, everyone at home. And for